Well, my friends, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 5, and before we get into the text, let's just bow our heads and ask for the Lord's help. Heavenly Father, Lord, help us to celebrate the sacrifice and the resurrection of your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, because you love us with great love. Open the eyes of our hearts to see and to realize who and what your Son is for us. Lord, please use your word to reveal to us your majesty and glory. Bring the lost, the unsaved, to salvation in Christ. Give them new hearts, hearts that are transformed by your grace and truth to trust in Jesus and love him and worship him. Please use your word to refresh the hearts of believers that we may see again your greatness and goodness. Renew our minds, Lord. Cause us to rediscover our soul's satisfaction in Jesus, that we would rejoice in Jesus and reverently worship his holy name. Lord, grab the attention of everyone here, children, adults, saved, unsaved. Lord, hold our attention with the truth the truth concerning your son. Overcome our resistance, captivate our hearts, subdue our hearts. We dedicate this service and the preaching of your word to you and your glory. Be magnified and be pleased. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So it sounds like my mic is cutting in and out. Grab that mic. And This is going to be quite difficult for me because I have to use my right hand to really emphasize my points. So hopefully that goes well. My friends, we're in Revelation chapter 5. As you may know, Revelation is an apocalyptic book. It's a very difficult book. To put it simply, the Apostle John, he was banished to the island of Patmos by the Romans. Why? Well, because he wouldn't stop preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and that Jesus is Lord, even over Caesar. So they didn't like that. So they banished him. And the Lord Jesus visited John by a symbolic vision on that island through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So in chapter 1, John introduces himself, of course, as the author of this book under the inspiration of the Spirit. And he also he gives us the first symbolic vision of his encounter with Jesus Christ. And, which is, a, by, by the way, a vision is a revelation, therefore the book of Revelation. And that's chapter 1. Chapter 2 and chapter 3, John records Jesus' messages of, of repentance and perseverance to his churches. And then in chapter 4, John is taken up to heaven by the Spirit, He's given another symbolic vision, but this time of God the Father, and on, right, the Father is on his throne, and he's surrounded by angels and men worshiping him, and John even records the songs that they worship the Father through. And then, in chapter 5, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John records for us another amazing symbolic vision, but this time it's concerning Jesus the Son of God, our Redeemer and King. Now, just for like a hint, when it comes to reading the book of Revelation, here's a common error that a lot of people make. A lot of people think that John, in the book of Revelation, saw future events, he saw reality, and then just decided to express or to describe that reality that he saw in, like, in symbolic form. That's not at all what happened. John saw the symbols. So what he's reporting to us is not his, like, I'm going to describe this with symbolism. He saw the symbolism. And how do, we, how do we know this? Well, it's just like in the book of Genesis when Joseph, he saw a couple of dreams. He saw, first he saw 
Um, they're out in the field and they're collecting sheaves and his sheaf is bigger than the rest of his families and then their sheaves bow down to his sheaf. So he sees symbols and he needs the Lord's interpretation to understand what those symbols mean. The second dream was of the sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him, right? So he's seeing sun, moon, and stars bowing down to him. Also with Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh, he saw symbols in his dreams, and he was wanting to know, what does this symbol mean? I'm seeing these seven healthy cows, then I'm seeing these seven not-so-healthy cows, and these seven unhealthy cows consume these seven healthy ones, and yet they don't look healthy afterwards, Right? So, again, it wasn't like Pharaoh said, I know what the dream means, and I'm going to describe it to you in symbolism. No, he saw the symbols. It's the same thing for Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar saw a symbol, and he wanted to know, what does the symbol mean? In the book of Amos, it's really all over the place, but in the book of Amos, right, it says, the Lord says to Amos, Amos, what do you see? And Amos says, I see a fruit basket or a basket full of fruit. And then the Lord goes on to describe what that symbol means. So in the book of John, uh, 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 sorry, the book of Revelation that John records for us, he's not describing things symbolically, but seeing them without symbol. He's seeing the symbol and then writing down the symbol for us. Does that make sense? So it's not as if he's seeing the reality without the symbol. He's only seeing the reality with the symbol. And just like with Joseph and Daniel and Amos and all the other prophets, they needed the Lord to interpret this symbolic vision. And the, the question may be, well, can we even interpret this, these symbolic visions of the book of Revelation? And the answer is yes. Because all the symbols that are used, every single one of them, they are reused symbols. Meaning, God is... God is taking symbols he's already used, and he's reusing them, which means if you want to interpret those symbols, you have to interpret them according to the interpretations that were in the other scriptures. So the book of Revelation is interpretable, by the way. Um, and yes, it is symbolic, and its symbolism is tough for us. But nonetheless, that's kind of a little hint into when you read Revelation, John is describing what he is seeing. He's not, he's not putting it in there like, you know what? Just to spice things up, I'm going to be more cryptic than necessary. <laughs> no, he's seeing cryptic visions, and he's just reporting the cryptic vision to us. So keep that in mind. So in chapter 5, there's two all-important questions that John is raising and answering for us. So here are the two questions. First, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And you can even ask it, what is Jesus? Who is he? What is he? That's the first question. The second question is, what happens when you see Jesus as he truly is? That's the second one. As you can see, though this is a difficult book, it is answering very basic questions, even for, even for kiddos. So Ezra and Juniper, you can, you can get what John is trying to say here, what he's seeing in visions. Who is Jesus? What happens when you see Jesus as he truly is? So let's take an in-depth look at the first seven verses to answer that first question. So the first seven verses of Revelation chapter 5, let's see how John, by the Spirit, answers the question, who is Jesus? So Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, then I, John, I saw, so he's reporting what he saw, I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. So what did John see? He saw a scroll. And notice where this scroll was. The scroll is located in the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. Well, who is that? Well, that's the one who was described in Revelation chapter 4. That's God the Father. The one who is holding the scroll, the one who is seated on the throne, is none other than the Father. And the Father is not seated on an ordinary throne, is he? Neither is he holding an ordinary scroll. The throne that God is seated upon represents the authority that exclusively belongs to him as our creator and ruler. Steve Lawson said it this way, every person 
every nation, every event is subject to this throne. And notice that this throne is occupied, uh, what I'm trying to point out here is, God is not an absentee landlord. He's not an absentee, he's very much on the spot. God himself is presently and eternally seated upon his throne in heaven. Now this would give great comfort to John. Because as you know, John is undergoing persecution. He is separated from the people he loves. He is, he's exiled on an island um, as a prisoner. He's already been tortured. He has suffered much at the hands of the Romans. And so it, it ought to give him comfort, comfort, and it ought to give us comfort that God is enthroned over the affairs of this world and has not left history to run its own course. That ought to be a comfort for you as it was to John. And now notice what John says about this scroll in the Father's right hand. It says, A scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. So this is a very unique scroll. Because in those days, you only wrote on the inside, and then you sealed the document. But this scroll has writing on the inside and the outside, and it's not just sealed with a single seal, it is sevenfold in its ceiling. Seven's an important number ever since the creation of the world. Why? Because, well, the Lord made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. So seven has always been the number of completion ever since the creation of this world. It's a way to say completeness or fullness thereof, or maybe even perfect. So this scroll has writing on the inside and on the outside, which suggests that the content of this scroll is so extensive that it can't be contained on just one side of it. The writings overflow to the outside of the document because this document is exhaustive, it's precise, it leaves no detail unaddressed. And since God is the one holding this scroll, it is therefore assumed that God is the author of it. God wrote this document. And since this scroll is sealed with seven seals, therefore what is written is fixed. It's unchangeable. It can't be altered. It's impossible for any creature, any angel, any mere man to open this document, to peer into it, or to read it as we will soon see in the next verses. So what exactly is this scroll? What is it? Well, this scroll in the hand of the Father in Revelation chapter 5 is the scroll that will be un- unsealed and carried out in chapter 6 of Revelation and following. The scroll is the written record of God's plan. This is the pre-written decrees of God concerning judgments, the exact judgments that the Lord will execute in the book of Revelation on those who refuse to repent. But this scroll also contains of salvation and deliverance, which the Lord will work out for his people in the book of Revelation as well. Now, this isn't merely what God, this scroll isn't just God looking to the future and writing down what he sees. He's not just, this isn't just foreseen. This is what God has eternally predetermined. So he sees it because he determined it. That's a a mesmerizing thought. And it ought to comfort you that our God rules and reigns. He's not dealt a hand and then good luck with that, Lord, right? He's the one that determines the future, not just sees the future. Now, verse 2. And I saw, I, John, again, notice he's recording what he saw. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. So he saw the angel and he's hearing the proclamation. What's the proclamation? It's a question. Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? Question is super important. It's not a, <clears throat> not a question that you want to skim over. It's a very important question. The author <clears throat> is suggesting in this vision that um, this is an inescapable question. The angel says it so loud because it's so important. Uh, one pastor put it this way. The angel interrupts John's focus and asks the inescapable question. Who is worthy to open this scroll and break its seals? In other words, who is worthy, who is capable 
of executing God's judgments and bringing about redemption for God's people. Who is able to usher in the kingdom of God upon the earth? Who is worthy to take the reins of history and direct it toward God's purposes? Who is worthy? And verse 3 provides an answer to that. Look what it says in verse 3. And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. In other words, the largest search ever conducted was conducted. All throughout the created universe, there was a search for one who was worthy to look into this scroll, to peer into it. No angel could do it. No mere human could do it. All of creation is totally incapable of handling such a weighty divine task. My friends, in other words, you and I are underqualified. We are unable to peer into God's infinitely complex plan, let alone bring about that plan. This is humbling. It's humbling, I would say. Here's John's response to all of this. This is verse 4. And I, John, began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. John is utterly grief-stricken. He's despairing over the thought that God's scroll, if, if no one can open it, if no one can peer into it, how will it be accomplished? If no one's capable of opening it, is anyone capable of doing it? It's like John is thinking all hope for justice and salvation is lost. It's just too tough of a task. But then verse 5 breaks in. And one of the elders said to me, said to John, here's the command, weep no more. John's crying is abruptly interrupted by this elder. And this elder, make no qualms about it, this elder rebuked John. This glorified leader tells John to put an end to his sobbing. Stop your despairing, he says. It's a totally inappropriate response to this. That's a wrong response. And then this elder gives another command to John. He says, behold. Behold what? What am I supposed to be looking at? Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David. My friends, <clears throat> there is one who is worthy. There is one who is able to lay hold of this scroll and to perform its, de its decrees. And John is commanded to look, to fix his eyes upon this unique one, this lion, this root. Now we know that this is a symbol for Jesus. This is a symbol for the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the eternal Son of God. And here's the reason um, why Jesus wasn't originally found in that search. Because the search um, was conducted in creation concerning a creature. But Jesus is the creator of creatures. This is why Jesus, he's, ac he's actually uniquely worthy and able to do what no angel or mere man can do. Yes, Jesus is truly and fully man. But more so, uh, Jesus is also truly and fully God. So he is uniquely worthy and able. Now, consider that first description, that first symbol here. The lion of the tribe of Judah. This is referring to a prophecy given to us in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Is that not crazy? We're in the last book. And John wants to bring up a symbol that if one were to look up the reference of that symbol, you have to go all the way to the beginning. In Genesis 49, verses 9 through 10, this is where Jacob promised his son Judah the right to rule over all the sons of Jacob and all the tribes that come from them. So then, the tribe of Judah is royalty. Judah is the tribe of kings. And guess who is from the tribe of kings? Jesus, according to his human nature. Jesus is from the tribe of kings. From, he's from the tribe of Judah. Now, <clears throat> this, is, 
This is primarily expressing the, the, the uniqueness of Jesus' human nature. <clears throat> He's a descendant of a man. He is human, and he comes from the right tribe, the tribe of kings, because he is the king of kings. So this is specifically a, a qualification for the Messiah. If God were to, were to write his son's job description beforehand, he would say just this. Expect, expect my son to do this for you. Expect your savior to be like this, to descend from Judah. He is, my son is a king, and he'll come from a line of kings. So, there it is. That's the first symbol. The second symbol, the root of David. I've gotten this one wrong. Notice it doesn't say branch of David or shoot of David. This, ought, this symbol ought to remind us of Isaiah chapter 11. In Isaiah chapter 11, it's said both ways. It says that the, there was a righteous branch, there was a Messiah coming, and he's, he's, he's going to be the branch or the shoot of Jesse. Now, Jesse is the father of David. So he's going to come from Jesse. He's going to come from David. But also, in Isaiah 11, just like here in Revelation 5, it doesn't say branch. It says root. Isaiah 11 also says that this righteous Messiah, he's also the root of Jesse. He's the root of David, meaning he doesn't, he doesn't merely descend from Jesse and David. He's the divine creator and supporter of Jesse and David. So this is actually a symbol not of Jesus' humanity, but of his divinity. He's the one who undergirds David. You know, all of David's mighty acts and all the war stories that we hear of David? Well, it was all accomplished by the root of David. And that root is Jesus. Isn't that marvelous? So right here, two symbols. Two symbols describing one person. And this one person is fully human. He is a descendant from, from Judah. And then also, he's divine because he's the root. He's the divine creator and supporter of David. David accomplished all that he accomplished because of this root which supported him. So my friends, these are credentials for the Messiah, and we know from Scripture that Jesus perfectly fulfills all these credentials. He has the right to rule, and he is divine. He is the ruler, the divine ruler. But notice, again, focus on the word lion. This is depicting someone who was tough. It's depicting a victorious and tough king. Right? One who is mighty. One who has fearsome ability to dominate and to conquer. Lions are not prey. Lions are predators. They're called apex predators. They are terrifying and they are strong. In fact, Juniper and I just watched, I didn't finish the movie because, no, I did finish the movie. But Juniper didn't finish the movie. It's called Beast. And it's about a lion that goes on the tear, and it was terrifying, and Juniper just ran out of the room because of a lion doing lion things to people who aren't lions, right? Human beings are not equipped to just to go one-on-one -on -one with a lion. And, uh, and that scared Juniper, and it kind of scared me too. But nonetheless, the symbol here is a lion. This is a lion-like king. David was known for being fearsome in battle, right? He conquered kings. The Lord put nations under David's feet, so to say. So then Jesus, the promised king, the promised Messiah, he is unrivaled in power. He is unrivaled in his dominance. In fact, all right, look at what it says. It says, he has conquered. You just, did you notice that? Past tense. Past tense. He has conquered. The line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. That's why he qualifies. That's why he's worthy to open what he's about to open. He has conquered. Meaning Jesus, the lion-like king, has already won a grand and de decisive victory. And therefore, he's worthy, he's able 
he's capable of opening the scroll and breaking its seals and carrying out God's redemptive plan. My friends, this is exactly what you need to hear this morning. Look at Jesus. Look at the symbol of Jesus here. He's a victorious lion. You feel as if you're being overcome, but he's the overcomer. He overcame. He conquered. As John was commanded to behold this conquering lion, we ought to fix our hearts upon Jesus, our victorious Savior. Amen, church? Look at verse 6. It says, he's commanded to look, so now he's going to obey that command, and he's going to turn and look. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. There is a really interesting patterned, patterned theme throughout the book of Revelation. Often throughout the book of Revelation, John is told something, so he hears something, and he's told to go and look at the reality that he just heard about. So he heard about a reality, and now he's supposed to turn and look at it. And throughout the book of Revelation, the pattern is what John hears and then turns and looks at, though it's the same thing, it's described in drastically different symbols. I mean, what can get more different than lion to lamb? Right? So we have another symbol right here. He goes looking for this lion, but what he sees is a lamb standing as though it had been slain. So John turns, he obeys the command. He's looking around to find this mighty conquering lion, but instead there's this meek lamb. And the lamb, as we know, is Jesus. We know this because of John 1.29. John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And who was John pointing at? Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God. And now, not John the Baptist, but John, the son of Zebedee, John the Apostle, he used the exact same symbol that John the Baptist used. Behold, the Lamb. Behold, the Lamb of God. And surprisingly, not only is Jesus a lion and a lamb, He is the lamb who is standing as though he had been slain. So this lamb has gone through a battle and was slaughtered in that battle. But nonetheless, he's standing alive. Slow down. So he sees a lamb. This lamb is standing upright. It's it's alive. But this lamb suffered a slaughter. He's the one who died and then rose from the dead. That Greek word behind slain means to cut up, to mutilate, which is exactly the terms used to refer to animal sacrifices, by the way. And that's exactly what Jesus voluntarily suffered for us. Jesus was butchered. He's, he was slaughtered physically, but even more so spiritually for us. When John turned and saw this slain lamb, he must have seen the scars of its suffering and slaughter. So it definitely was slaughtered. And through this symbol, John was reminded that Jesus bore all our sins. Jesus absorbed all of God's wrath and judgment for due our sin. This slain lamb is the perfect symbol of Jesus' death and sacrifice, but also of resurrection. Yes, Jesus is gentle and lowly. He's meek. This is a perfect symbol of that. But he's not just a slain lamb. He is a risen lamb. In other words, if he's standing, this is the conquering one. This is the one who did the conquering. He conquered by being slaughtered and then rising again. He, he won by suffering defeat and then rising again. Isn't that interesting? What a, what a confusing symbol. But nonetheless, we know what he's saying. We know the reality that the symbol's pointing to. It's pointing to Jesus, the one who looked like he suffered defeat. He looked like it. Everyone at the cross thought... See, 
This proves that Jesus isn't who he says he is. And yet the cross proves that Jesus is exactly who he says he is. My friends, do you see who Jesus is? Do you see what he's done for you? Jesus is truly God and truly man. He's fully God and fully man. He fully obeyed for our righteousness. He kept the law. He patched together a perfect resume of righteousness so that he can transfer his righteousness to those who believe in him. Jesus was fully punished for our sins. It's true. God will leave no sin unpunished. Right here. My friends, all our sins, and they're, it's a horrible mountain of them. Oh, but Jesus took the punishment for every single one of his people's sins. My friends, this is amazing. Jesus fully rose from the dead. He stands in victory. He's the conquering one, and he's the one who gives life eternal. Amen, church? Jesus accomplished all that is necessary for sinners to be saved. Every bit of it. All that Jesus has done for you can only be received by turning to Jesus and trusting him, running to him, regretting your sin, running to him, relying upon him, and resting on his work, not your works, his work alone. Join me in verse 6. What else does John describe, or what else does this vision of Jesus uh, describe of him? It says, a lamb standing as though it had been slain. And this is, this is odd. This lamb has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So this lamb has seven horns. Steve Lawson says, this lamb has seven horns by which to inflict wounds. Seven is the number of completeness and perfection, indicating full dominance over all opposition to his will. Seven horns denotes that he possesses unrivaled, irresistible dominance to inflict defeat upon those who would try to butt heads with him. Just try to butt heads with this lamb and you will lose. In other words, he is omnipotent. His power is insurmountable. No individual, no nation can successfully rise up against this sovereign lamb. It reminds me of Psalm 2. Kings, you better, you better repent. You better kiss the sun lest you perish in the way. So Jesus, the lion lamb, has seven horns representing his infinite, unchangeable power. He also has seven eyes. And it says seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the world. Again, seven, shorthand for full. If something is sevenfold, it's full, it's perfect, it's complete. To have seven eyes means that Jesus sees everything. There is nothing that can escape this lamb's sight. Jesus is all-seeing, which is another way to say Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus is omniscient, knowing all things in one simple and eternal act. Now, when he says, when John says seven spirits of God, there's, there's layers to this. Seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Again, if you want to use seven the same way we've been using it, if he is sevenfold of the spirit of God, and that spirit is sent out into all the earth, it means that Jesus is ever-present through the ever-present spirit of God. The spirit is sevenfold in the sense that he is everywhere present all the time in his fullness. And therefore, Jesus and his divinity is everywhere present and at all time in his fullness. But why, why say it this way? That can be confusing. Actually, no. It's not confusing if we just knew our scriptures. Let's just turn to Isaiah 11. I love this. I have to show off how awesome God is. Isaiah 11. All of us can count, I, I believe. I have a couple of verses I want to read uh, I have three verses I want to read to us. Excuse me. Three verses. Isaiah 11, verses 1, 2, and 3. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Do you hear that? 
There's a, there's a descendant coming, and we know that descendant to be the righteous branch. That's Jesus, the Messiah. He's going to bear fruit. Now listen, verses 2 and 3. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might. I don't have another hand. You have to help me out here. The spirit of knowledge and fear. Did you count seven? That's seven. The sevenfold spirit of God was told to us in Isaiah 11, verse 2, and this is the spirit that rests upon the Messiah when he comes. Is that not awesome? The sevenfold spirit is upon him, and his delight, the spirit anointed Messiah, his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what he see, his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. My friends, that's awesome. That is truly amazing. And as you can see, the way that I just interpreted seven or sevenfold is exactly how we ought to interpret all symbols. We go searching the scriptures. God is reusing symbols here. My friends, there you have it. If you're back in Revelation 5, we've just seen through symbol the personhood and the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the lion-like lamb and the lamb-like lion who is standing though he was slaughtered. He conquered. Who is himself, Jesus is himself, infinite power, infinite knowledge, infinite presence according to his divine nature, and he endured suffering. He endured slaughter and resurrection according to his human nature. There is nothing more shocking or satisfying than Jesus. Jesus is both mighty and meek. He's both great and gentle. He's both standing yet slaughtered, both a conquering lion and a slaughtered lamb. Jesus is all-powerful, and yet he used, oh, he used his power not to avoid suffering, but to go straight into suffering so that he would die for us. Think about that. If you had all power, would you use your power so that you would make sure you could die? He did. Look at, look at the condescension, the humiliation of our Savior. Jesus knows all, and he is present everywhere. This is Jesus, my friends. Oh, now look at verse 7. This lion lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. What is that? It's as if this victorious lion lamb warrior has returned from battle. Kind of like death, burial, resurrection, and ascension to the Father's right hand. He's returned from battle to be honored for his great victory and then to take up the next mission. Jesus, the lion lamb, does only what he can do here. Jesus lays hold of the Father's plan with the unstoppable intent to accomplish all that is written. As one author put it, Jesus is not represented as a frustrated Savior who is anxious for someone to accept him. Guys, just come on, just let me in. Guys, come on, just, can you just believe in me? That's not at all the symbols that are represented here. There's no panic in Jesus' voice. Jesus remains completely in control of the world, not only in the macro sense, but in the micro sense. Dust motes don't move unless Jesus says, you go here and you go there. Supernovas, they don't move unless Jesus says, you go over that, that way. You exist. I'll, I'll allow you to exist. My friends, is this the Jesus that you think of when you sing and pray? Is this the, you think of these attributes, these perfections, these accomplishments when you try to lay hold in your mind the person and work of Jesus? Is this the Jesus that you've trusted? Is this the Jesus you've turned to? 
Are you relying on this Jesus for your salvation? Is this the Jesus you teach your kids about? Is this the Jesus that you've come today to learn about and to praise? Who is Jesus? He's the conquering kingly lion, and he is a standing yet slain lamb. If you want want to know the answers to the question, there it is. Who is Jesus? My summary, Jesus is a conquering kingly lion. Jesus is a standing yet slain lamb. Now, let's make this next question, this next point, super obvious and simple, because it is. Look with me in verses 8 through 14. Let's just find out together what a proper response to Jesus is. Let's just take a note. Let's just observe the angels and the glorified leaders in heaven. Let's just look at what they do. I think, that, I think the angels in heaven have a pretty clear sight of Jesus. I think that the saints who have died and gone before, I think those who are in the presence of Jesus have a pretty good idea what a good response to Jesus would be. Let's find out what happens when you see Jesus as he truly is. Verses 8 through 14. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. They fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you, worthy are you, Jesus, to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. Hear that? You ransomed, you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. That means Jesus' efficacious blood, the blood that doesn't just give you the possibility of salvation, it actually saves you. We don't call a firefighter a hero because he has the potential to be a hero. We call a firefighter a hero when he goes and does the act and doesn't fail. Jesus is a, is a savior in that sense. He's not, like, he's not a, a potential savior to people. He's a savior because he goes and saves. And he does it by his blood. And you notice, he paid for specific people from every tribe, language, people, and nation. He paid for specific individuals in all those categories. And they, he's made them, is that past tense? You have made, yeah, that's past tense. You have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And look what it says, and they shall reign on the earth. Huh. They're going to reign on the earth. Then I, John, looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Let's, let's get our fingers out to number this. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Sevenfold praise. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshiped. How do you think you should respond to Jesus? Like that. They fell down before the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, and they sang and they worshiped. Their hearts were full of serious joy for Jesus. Oh, there's a time to be silly. There's a time for silly joy, but there's also a very, there's a time for serious joy. That's a time for serious joy. No cracking jokes at that point. Who is Jesus? He is a conquering kingly lion. He is a standing yet slain lamb. And what happens when you see Jesus as he truly is? You give yourself the humble, heartfelt, joyful worship of of him. That's what you do. You fall down before his feet, just like the leper, before his feet, face to the ground. Why did we go over Revelation today? Why why Revelation 5? 
Do you see, do you see the pattern from Exodus 33 and 34, Isaiah 6, Isaiah 49, and here in Revelation 5? See a pattern? When you see God as he truly is, you respond appropriately. You and I, we need truth about the one we ought to worship. When we actually have that truth and we believe it by God's grace, our response to him will be appropriate. So if you're ever going, my heart is so sluggish, you need to look at the symbol of his power. You need his word of truth to help you understand that there's something about his presence or his knowledge or his holiness or his love that you're misplacing. There's some truth that you're belittling. There's something that you're doubting. My friends, right worship of Jesus requires a right perception and dependence on Jesus. If you're going to worship Jesus as he requires, you have to have a right perception and dependence on him. So are you worshiping him? Are you thinking of him as he truly is? Are you trusting him as you should? Do you tremble at his power? at his knowledge, at his presence, at his, at his sovereign authority? Are you consoled by his unflinching courage to be slaughtered for you, to bear your sin and take his father's wrath for you? And Jesus didn't just die for you. He defeated death for you. Jesus put death to death and rose again, never to die again. Does that grip you with awe? It should Unbelieving friends, now is the time to repent. It's, it is time to believe in Jesus. Look, look and believe. Trust in Christ. If you do, you'll be saved. You'll be brought back to God to enjoy God fully and forever. Believing friends, now is the time to worship Jesus by continuing in repentance, continuing to live out your faith in Jesus. Why turn and trust in Jesus? Why, why should you do such a thing? Why should you ever strive to try to do such a thing like, like that? Because Jesus is the only lion who became a lamb for you. Jesus is the only king that had every right to slaughter you with his wrath, but instead he lovingly chose to be slaughtered for you. Think about this. He absorbed and exhausted all of his wrath that you deserve. And he paid for every ounce. Who else would do that for you? Who would do that for me? My best of friends. No. They all fall short of this one. Is there anyone more worthy of your trust? Is there anyone more worthy of your love? Is there anyone more worthy of your worship? When you are, when you... When Tuesday comes around and you're kind of feeling like, oh, man, I really wish it was the weekend already and I really hate my job right now or I got to deal with this problem that I don't really want to, I don't want this problem to exist. I just want it to disappear or I just want to get away from the problems that I'm facing or, and I just, and you're feeling, I just don't feel like worshiping right now. Well, don't start there. Wait, who is the one I ought to be worshiping? Why do you, why does he deserve my worship all the time? What would, what would make someone so worthy of that? What, what has he done for me? Oh, what has he done for me? My friends, Jesus brings all heaven and earth to its knees by his worthiness to be worshipped here. And yet he laid down his life for you. What has he done for you? That. He rose again as well. And he invites you to receive him as your greatest treasure and, his, and your only savior. Repent with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us now. We want to respond to your word in a way that we know is appropriate, a way that we know is fitting. Help us to do that. Lord, we love you, but we stand in awe of your love for us. Oh, Lord, help us now in Christ's name. Amen.